Hi, Charlie. Hey. Give me your paw. Give me your other paw. Hi. Well done, Charlie. How does a tiger roar? Hey. Tiger, walk. Let's go for a walk. Let's go. Charlie, let's sing. Yes. And my heart will go on. So ritual dances, Native Americans. It is generally considered that speech is exclusively a human quality. No other species on Earth can speak. Scientists are still arguing over what the stimulus was for such a drastic separation from animals in describing and experiencing the world. What are the mechanisms of the brain involved in the processes of speech formation? How important is attention and memory for communication between people? Finally, what is the basis of our understanding of each other? I think you have realized what's going on here. However, this ability to understand each other without words has its limitations. For example, these gestures wouldn't make much sense to the inhabitants of the islands in Oceania. But members of European culture will understand them easily. The fact is that symbols and signs of communication have been perfected over many generations. This system of signs allows us to communicate with each other. We are surrounded by semiotics, railway signals, traffic lights that you see on the road. They all have their own meaning, their own syntax. A small number of signs is enough for hockey players to understand the referee, stockbrokers, their clients, and lovers, each other. In this, we probably aren't too different from animals with their own sign systems. But try using these signs to explain the Pythagorean theorem or to tell someone how to make a soup. It won't work. We need abstract categories and concepts that can be defined only by words. A language is also a system of signs. However, when we proceed to interpersonal and other types of communication and interaction, when a person becomes immersed in society, written and oral speech can take the dominant role. The Duke yet lives that Henry shall depose. An ambiguous quote from William Shakespeare's Henry VI. There are two interpretations of this sentence. Due to the alteration of the natural order of words, the phrase can mean either that Henry will depose the Duke or that the Duke will depose Henry. Well, but there is also a context that affects the meaning of the statement. Obviously, human language is a very delicate tool of communication and must be used very skillfully. I would say that Morse code is the ideal form of communication. Whatever you send over to the other side will be decrypted directly as it is. Human language has nothing to do with it, because separate words, phrases, and texts have different meanings depending on the context which may be quite varied. Not only what was said and who said it matters, but also when it was said, what the conversation was about the day before, and so on. It is a great mystery how we manage to agree on anything at all. How often do we hear, no, no, sorry, I didn't mean to say that, you understood me wrong. But how does it happen that we say one thing and people around us hear something else? What's the reason for that? because everyone has their own experience. Each of us has his or her own set of numerous lexical units. That is, lexemes, words, syntactic constructs, all derived from our individual lives. 
reading literature, active communication, and so on. So the number of these units is not exactly the same for everyone. Age, upbringing, place of residence, what you read, all have an influence, and the list is endless. I no longer take physiological parameters, because we are all different. Everyone's mood can be different. Charlie, what about sleeping? Do you want to sleep? Sleep? No sleep. Lie down. And my heart will go on. How are you? Are you okay? Okay. You feel bad? Bad. Charlie say, I'm leaving. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So, how do we perceive speech? Imagine a circus, a tent, rows of chairs, a curtain, a delighted audience, and acrobats performing high above. A dozen words. You might ask, what variations can there be? A circus is a circus. But if each of us could print out a picture from our head, we wouldn't have a single pair of identical pictures. They would all be different in some ways. How then do equally acquired words and their meanings give rise to such different images of reality in a way that is specific to each individual? Most scientists believe that the ability to formulate words first and then phrases and sentences is genetically embedded in us. Every human child is born with the genetic prerequisites for mastering any language on Earth as his or her native tongue. Heaven forbid if someone who's watching the program believes that a child is born with an inner ability for a particular language, Russian, Hindi, or, say, Swahili. That's not true at all. Every child has the innate ability to decode any language. We learn to hear, to see, to taste, to feel pain or joy, to take first steps, to speak. By the age of 12 months, the child develops strong links between the sounds of speech and elementary concepts, the first fully shaped feelings and emotions. First of all, what does a child react to? He or she reacts to intonation. Through intonation, he can understand how to act. This signal can be positive, negative, neutral, and so on, and he receives some kind of feedback. It gives him an opportunity to develop his understanding. If he feels discomfort, he cries. If he is okay, there's another signal for that. Do you remember the legend about the Tower of Babel? It was possible to build a grandiose structure only on the condition that all the builders could speak the same language, that is, understand each other. But God, as punishment for their pride, separated people by giving them different languages. The Tower of Babel was never built. A mom says to her son, jump. Are you jumping, baby? Jump, jump. What is going to be on his mind at that moment? In his brain, zones are activated that are responsible for the neural representation of motion. They are in the motor cortex, and at the same time, the auditory zones, associated with the neural representation of the auditory structure of the word. And at the same time, the auditory zones, associated with the neural representation of the auditory structure of the word, are activated as well. Right? And there is a correlation between them. If you have this combination of sounds repeated many times, the act of jumping and the word jump create an associative grid, which is necessary for the occurrence and representation of a meaning in your brain that is interconnected with this motion. Okay. A smartphone is indeed smart. It can even measure your pulse. A lot of details, a lot of apps. But we know that almost all of its information is stored on a flash card. 
music, photos, videos, text messages. We insert the card into another phone and we move the information. Human and animal brains are not structured in the same way as computer technology. You can't find a flashcard with memories on it. All memory is distributed in hundreds of billions of connections between nerve cells. When pulses run through the chain of these cells many times with the same frequency, you remember the event. If you manage to artificially excite these cells in the same order, a familiar tune will sound in your head. And there are more combinations of neurons in the head than atoms in the universe. An amazing feature of memory is that our brain never stops its development. Only now its stimuli are not some kind of chemical signals as in the embryo, but psychological and cognitive events in the surrounding world. Every event that causes some sort of new surprise in the network of our cells makes our brain remember it and change and develop. Remember what you did yesterday afternoon, and the day before yesterday, and last week? Do you remember the face of the man who was sitting across from you on the subway this morning? And what song did you hear on the radio when you turned it on? It's difficult, isn't it? Just think, a person can remember all states of consciousness, everything that they have ever seen or heard in their life. But we don't remember everything, all movies that will ever be shot, all books that will ever be written. Our brain will find a way to reflect all this, and a part of it will remain in our memory. Why only a part remains is a different question. We don't remember every moment of our life. We have a filter that protects our perception from overloading information, our attention. Attention is like a gate to our consciousness. In other words, we can realize something only when we pay attention to it. And we can, for example, fully identify the attention with consciousness. That is, everything that falls into our attention will be reflected on. Perhaps attention is only a part of consciousness. Let's check how attentive you are. Now in front of your eyes, a crime will be solved. In the story, the detective has to find the killer who is in this room. You need to follow the participants of the story, not missing any details, their eyes, mimics, and gestures. The criminal will surely give himself away. So our detective has identified the criminal. Have you been closely following the suspects? Did you miss anything? I'm sure that you have overlooked some details. Let's check. Painting. Hat. Instead of a typewriter, there's an orange construction helmet. And the victim underwent some obvious changes. Not surprisingly, a few people managed to notice all the changes in this scene. After all, attention was focused on the detective story and the search for the criminal. 
Imagine that you approach an apple tree with a lot of ripe apples growing on it. You choose an apple that seems the ripest, the most delicious to you. At the same time, in your perception, there are other apples. But if you do not choose an apple, then you will not be able to act further, because your choice will be unlimited. You will be like Buridan's donkey, which couldn't decide between a sack of hay and a pail of water and eventually died. Close your eyes for 20 seconds and don't open them. Ready? Now listen. Information agencies all over the world are screaming about a sensation. A spacecraft of non-earthly origin was discovered in Earth's orbit. Now you are not just listening, but also trying to visually draw this picture in your head. No one knows what a real alien ship looks like, but everyone imagines it from fantasy books and movies. Your attention reacted to the novelty and gave a command to the brain to find everything about the object and to compose its image from the information distributed across many memory cells. Yes, it's a scattered network. So when we talk about memory, we don't talk about one single cell in a certain area of the brain. We actually talk about a network scattered around the brain. But to some extent, that's why it helps us. Many, many associations, visual, sound, smell, and tactile sensations immediately create a whole spectrum for perception. So ritual dances, Native Americans. Tribe. A prayer. Gods. It's a plea. The pagan tribes. Natives. Yes, exactly, yes. Natives? What's that? What? Tribe? Pygmies? Before we begin to say or write something, a number of memories and associations connected with certain words arise in our head. For example, the word Africa. What's that? Is this an animal? Tent? Banana. Elephant? Trunk? Elephant and trunk. An elephant. Elephant? India. Jungles. India. India. And? Greater India. Africa. Asia? Africa. Hooray! So guys, admit it. I'm the genius of associations. <laughs> Immediately, we imagine savannah, heat, elephants, lions, zebras, tribesmen. But try to imagine something more abstract, say, a state of delight. How would one describe it in words? So you have decided on something, and you want to describe this thought, but you can't find the words for it. Have you ever had this happen in your life? Probably everyone has experienced it. And then there is a replacement. Our communicative mechanism is so sophisticated, it replaces the linguistic elements with extra-linguistic ones, timber characteristics, intonation, prosody, and so on. <laughs> Each of us is certainly able to catch different intonations in the voice, changes in facial expression, in the eyes, in the speed of speech. So we understand that one person is annoyed, another is ashamed, and the third is trying to please us. Communication is also an emotional process with an incredibly rich palette of colors and shades. Let's say I tell you a phrase with a falling intonation. It's so easy. In a different situation, I might tell you something with a rising intonation. It's so easy. These are completely different statements. In the first case, I meant to say, why did you fall? It was so easy. Or I said, I didn't expect it to be so easy. Why did I even worry about it? So with this simple example, I wanted to demonstrate to you that extra-linguistic components of communication, such as the pitch of the voice, the intonation, 
its melodic differences and modulations, volume, tempo, rhythm, all of them play a bigger role in communication than the language's sign system. In all communication, associations constantly emerge in memory, and the intonation and tempo come naturally afterward. It's all done in order to express one's thoughts and ideas more accurately. Sometimes these associations even interfere. It's a common name too, something to do with a horse. Is it Maris? No, it isn't Maris. Wait a minute, is it Colt? No, it isn't Colt. I know it perfectly well, it's a horsey name, but it has absolutely gone out of my head. We've all been in a situation when we just couldn't remember a familiar word, for example, the title of a film or the name of an actor. And it seems that the word is on the tip of our tongue. This phenomenon is even called tip of the tongue. And all kinds of associations may arise. Sometimes they are very unexpected. The characters of this short story by the famous Russian playwright Chekhov are trying to remember the name of a man, but their association with a horse prevents them from doing so. They think it had to do with the animal, not what it eats. Foley, Hackney, Carter, they consider dozens of different options. But only in speaking about a load of hay do they remember the name Hayes. Did you know that every time we remember something, we practically remove those memories from long-term storage and transfer them into short-term memory? Giving our consciousness access to it. Once used, this information is returned to its place as if it had been re-recorded. But here's what's interesting. If something happens at this moment, for example, you remember your first teacher and suddenly the phone rings, now this information will be closely related to a particular event, the phone call. And the next time you need to extract the teacher's name from memory, you'll remember the content of that conversation. Each time I extract some period of my life from memory, for example, I'm thinking about the place where I spent my summer holidays, I might think about where I want to go next time, and this thought will calm me down. But next time when I start thinking about my summer holidays, I'll remember not only the place I went to, but also where I would like to go, where I was planning to go next time. So what did I do? I extracted the memory, experienced new information, and rewrote the association of the previous memory trail with the new memory trail. And thus, every time we retrieve it from the memory, we rewrite it. There's a process, rejuvenation of memory. The idea behind it is that we constantly need to extract important things from memory, and when we think about them, we memorize them again. And if we don't have brain structures and systems that are responsible for memorizing those things, they begin to melt away and leave our memory without being able to be updated. The hippocampus is an important part of the limbic brain system. This structure acts as a storekeeper that places information on the shelves of our memory. One information that is not in particular demand is far away, and the one that is more important and required more often is closer. But the frontal lobes of the brain are engaged in the search for information in memory and its extraction. Interestingly, there is also a difference between the left and right areas of the frontal lobes. If you're looking for general information, activation is observed in the left prefrontal regions of the brain. If the information is personal, you are searching for elements of your personal experience, autobiographical memory, and the right structures of the prefrontal cortex are engaged. Almost every man has a box with household tools at home. Inside, there are compartments for tools with different purposes.
a wrench, for example. You get it out of your box very rarely. And some tools have been there for years, but you still keep them. You never know, you may need them one day. But for example, a screwdriver and pliers are there in the most prominent place, because you constantly use them. Our memory is the same. The required information is stored where we will not lose it and hardly forget it, and everything else is distributed to different departments. There is so-called procedural memory. It is about how to do things, how to brush your teeth. When you get up in the morning, you don't think, how do I use this toothbrush? How should I hold it? Or to brush my teeth, which way do I brush? It's something we do subconsciously. There are different memory systems in our brain. In the brain means that there are structures responsible for our consciousness or episodic memory, autobiographical memory. There are structures that are responsible for the development of skills, training. There are structures that are responsible for the formation of knowledge. When some of them are destroyed, very specific knowledge might be lost. For example, knowledge only about animals or knowledge about numbers. When the other ones are destroyed, an episodic memory may disappear, and this person begins his life anew as if waking up every 30 to 60 seconds. If he or she is distracted, for example, the door slams or someone comes in, the person might turn to you and ask who you are and what you were saying. Jules Verne said he had traveled the world just sitting in his chair. Indeed, if you close your eyes, you can move from summer to winter, see cities that you have never been to, and even worlds that no one knows of. This is possible thanks to our ability of imagination and prospective memory, which connects the pictures of the past with the fantasies of the future and gives us variants of events in the present. It is an outstanding acquisition of evolution, allowing a person, without spending physical effort, to imagine different scenarios for the future in their own head, thus forming strategies of behavior. Unlike humans, animals do this in reality with a constant risk to life. That's the dogmatic point of view. There are a number of scientists who say that animals can also travel in time, and they have mental time travel, and they have episodic memory, that is, they can conjure facts, what, where, when, and why. You see how a bird is flying, and you imagine that you can build a wooden ship, and someone will navigate it, and the whole construction will fly. You associate the bird's ability to fly with an imaginary ship. I think when science fiction novelists write their works, they use certain associations that are uncommon for us in reality. Dreaming, fantasizing, drawing distant perspectives in imagination is the prerogative of any person. But with some brain injuries, these abilities dramatically deteriorate or disappear altogether. As a rule, this happens when the hippocampus is damaged, which is associated with memory overriding procedures. Patients with a damaged hippocampus lose their ability to imagine the future. When people with brain damage were asked whether they could suddenly begin to fantasize about any events that might occur in the future, it turned out that they lacked this ability. We need our memory not only to savor events of the past, but to allow us to travel through time, including the future. We need both autobiographical and episodic memory for that. We use memory mechanisms in any activity, whether it is tying our shoes or planning a vacation. But starting a particular kind of memory depends on the context of this activity. 
It's one thing to remember just a party in detail, and it's another thing to remember the same party, but with an important acquaintance. Memory mechanisms depend on the emotional and semantic significance of the event and its importance for specific actions. All this is estimated mainly in the prefrontal cortex of the cerebral hemispheres of the brain, which then sends commands to the hippocampus to extract this or that information. Sometimes the number of these commands is reduced to a minimum when the last work is done and the new one has not yet been started or when things become unimportant. Even if there's a raging sea of information, a flashing of faces on the street, traffic, phone calls, but suddenly you sense a familiar fragrance in the crowd, then the prefrontal cortex sends requests to the memory, activates attention, and the hippocampus gives the result, a recollection. I forgot to notify you, by the way. I am Dr. Alexander Kaplan, head of the Laboratory of Neurophysiology and Neurocomputer Interfaces at Moscow State University, and I will be elected president of the Republic of Cape Verde. Someone will laugh, someone will think me crazy, but someone will take it seriously. Anything can happen. Everyone will respond. Few people will remember the name of my laboratory, what I do, and even what my name is. But the statement about the presidency will be remembered because the brain chooses the most unexpected part of what I said. Involuntary attention immediately makes you distracted from anything that you're busy with. It's kind of telling you, look, there's something going on right now, which may be more important than what you're doing at the moment. You need to look over there, listen, and maybe react quickly. Either run away or vice versa. Come and see. And therefore, of course, it is very important evolutionarily. But how good is your brain's ability to notice everything new and unexpected while not paying much attention to the usual things. Being sane, we are sure that we can notice all of the changes that are happening before our eyes. Let's check. Keep an eye on what will happen on the screen. Hello, can I please have a cappuccino? Big or small? Big. Syrup? Cinnamon? Yes, cinnamon. The situation is familiar to all. You order your favorite drink, prepare cash to pay, give it to the person behind the bar counter, and count the change. Surprisingly, few people can immediately notice such seemingly obvious changes. Here you go, your cappuccino, $2.99. Thank you. You are welcome. Thank you. The thing is, we don't have to be focused on something. It's enough to be distracted just for a moment, and now we no longer see how another person appears instead of the first person. But if at the moment when a change is taking place, your perception is interrupted for a short moment, for example, you blink or you look in a different direction. That moment is enough for this change to go unnoticed if your attention was not focused on the object just before the change occurred. Up to the point that you may not notice the substitution of the interlocutor with whom you were talking. One, two, five, six, <laughs> so, what is the conclusion? 
we can't perform several tasks simultaneously and equally well, like Julius Caesar to whom extraordinary ability was often attributed. After all, if we get distracted or concentrate on something else, we miss something. Number 85. 31, 32, 33, 35, 36. For example, try to write all the letters of the alphabet with one hand in a row. And touch the left and right ear with the left arm simultaneously while counting aloud from 0 to 100. 31, 32, I got lost with K L M uh, one two. No, it's just impossible to do. I have to rewrite the alphabet. K L M N O P Q R. No, I'm clearly not Julius Caesar. In general, it is believed that only 2% of people on Earth have the same ability as Julius Caesar. In multitasking mode, we usually work poorly or we alternate the tasks. For example, we postpone the book while we talk on the phone or turn off the TV if we need to prove the Pythagorean theorem. That's okay for us. One, two, three, four. Researchers at Baylor Medical College watched nearly 100 physically healthy people over 64 years of age. So attention works selectively, and there's nothing we can do about it. But thanks to this, some events are postponed in our memory and become recollections and others are forgotten. But what about those people we consider the owners of phenomenal memory? How do they manage to remember seemingly everything? Researchers at Baylor Medical College watched nearly 100 physically healthy people over 64 years of age. The well-known memory formula states seven plus or minus two. It is believed that this is the number of objects we can be aware of and keep in our working memory at the same time. These first experiments back in the middle of the 20th century were sometimes carried out among a narrow circle of Nobel laureates. And this limitation seven plus or minus two was discovered. But just a year and a half ago, an article was published in a very serious magazine, magical number four plus or minus one and a half. It turns out the average data is even worse. The number is smaller. And some people in some situations are able to remember and work with only one object. So the magic number is equal to one. Let's check how this formula works. The participants in the experiment must remember 20 pictures, which are shown to them at intervals of two seconds. The first one, an ant. No, oh, a ladybug, a ladybug, yes. That's right, then an ant. An ant. Okay, next, a butterfly. Yeah, I think it's a butterfly too. That's right, yeah, okay, an elephant. Elephant? Together, yes, an elephant. But I don't remember what came I next. I can't remember. Try it. A turtle. Or a giraffe. So our participants were able to reproduce a sequence of only four images. And now a man with super memory enters the competition. A ladybug. Yeah. And then an ant. Yes. Then a butterfly, an elephant, a mushroom, a giraffe, a turtle, a mushroom, a stork, a fir tree, a camel, a camel, a bear, a bear, a fox, a fox, a penguin, amazing, a tiger, a bee, strawberries, an owl, next bullfinch, and a dandelion. Dandelion, that's great. People with similar abilities can easily remember not only bright pictures and images, 
a 16-digit credit card number? Easy. Just look at it for a few seconds. 5136, 100. Then 9140. Yeah. 58, 61. Okay. And finally, 6713. Yeah, next card. So 4268, then 1070. Yes. Then 4767. Yeah. And 8943. Yes. Yes, that's great. Some people can easily remember and reproduce huge sequences of numbers in large volumes of texts. And some remember everything. Such a phenomenon is called hypermnesia. A few years ago in America, an outstanding memory explorer, James McGaw, working in California, ran into a woman. She knew he was a memory specialist. She wrote him a letter asking him to investigate her memory with a very severe form of hypermnesia. She remembered every day and every event of every day that took place starting at the age of 9 or 10. You could ask her what happened on November 18, 1984, and she would tell you in detail what happened to her. And this information is quite reliable because she could remember some verifiable events, social events, films, sports competitions, political meetings. They were all checked. The letter A. How to explain the existence of people among us with the super developed? It has already been checked. There's no difference in brain structure. Maybe they somehow train their memory in a special way during their lifetime? In most cases, that's what it is. But what about the phenomenon of hypermnesia? It is unlikely that this ability can be developed independently. Mom. 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 They're kind of developmental mutants, just like children with autism or with other conditions, but in this case, it causes a kind of superpower. Many people with phenomenal memory have another condition called synesthesia, which goes hand in hand with hypermnesia. Synesthesia is the ability to perceive the phenomenon of one sensory pathway through sensory organs associated with another pathway. For example, colors like sounds, tastes like colors, colors like tactile sensations, and so on. The human brain is arranged in a way that all our main systems work for communication, perception, memory, attention, imagination, thinking, and of course, speech. Together we save and accumulate incredible baggage of life experience and knowledge from the ability to cook lunch to the design of spaceships. But none of this would have happened without the obvious and invisible ties of mutual communication between us. Mom. Mom. A ladybug, an ant. Most likely here lies the mystery of the emergence of Homo sapiens on Earth as well as that of our rapid success in the knowledge and exploration of the world around us.